Hello everybody, my name is Ray. Welcome to the Evangelical Dark Web. Today, we're going to be watching a woke preacher clip of Acts 29 discussing the issue of homosexuality. What does Acts 29, a famous church planting organization, believe about homosexuality, one of the biggest hot button issues facing the church right now? I might actually put this issue at number one above critical race theory and above feminism. So, pretty major issue, uh, the sexuality issue, is what does a major organization, I mean, this organization has lost its luster. Um, it did go downhill after, you know, Mark Driscoll for, you know, all his flaws. It would not have gone woke under his watch, and it certainly wouldn't be putting out this kind of content under his watch um, for all his flaws. And we just talked about him earlier this week. And that's been my only public comment on this video until now because we're going to do a deep dive on this cringe from Acts 29. But first, I want to let you know, Evangelical Dark Web is a Christian news gathering and commentary ministry. And you can support us over at evangelicaldarkweb.org slash join. This is our Patreon-like system that gets you more access to more content. And you can also check out our free Evangelical Dark Web newsletter. There are more articles than videos or podcasts, so you definitely want to check that out. But the least you can do is... Like this video, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Now, this video is kind of in a series of videos that we've done covering major Christian leaders, and I use Christian loosely, and their compromised position on homosexuality. In the past, we've talked about Andy Stanley. We've also talked about Rick Warren. And now we're going to be talking about Acts 29 based on this video that they put out and surfaced and went viral on the Internet. Hi, my name is Justin Anderson. I am the director of church planting for Acts 29, and I'm here with Mike Sullivan, who is the lead pastor at Emmaus City Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. Nailed it. <laughs> and uh, and we just got done. He, he did a main session. We're at the Northeast uh, Regional for Acts 29. Just did a main session uh, about how we can do ministry among uh, LGBTQ people. And I, I don't even want to say any more because I was just telling you the title of your message was so great and really became the framework for your talk. So maybe give us the actual title and then talk, maybe unpack a little bit of some of those ideas. Yeah. So the actual title was Walking with Jesus among our beloved LGBTQ. So I, I need to do a, a pause right now. We need a point of order. First of all, I don't think it's biblical to use acronyms when speaking about sin. That is to me unbiblical. That is a compromise in our language. And many well-meaning Christians do this. So I'm not singling them out for this. I will single them out for other things, but I'm not singling them out for this. A lot of well-meaning Christians do this. It's homosexuality, transgenderism, or homosexuals and transvestites. And then we can also talk about pedophilia and pedophiles. But let's, you know, cut down on the acronyms. Let's cut through the acronyms because, you know, you're not saving any syllables and you're just adding confusion when you talk like this, when you talk in alphabet soup. You know, I, I live in the Maryland area and I, you know, my day job has a lot of alphabet soup in it. It doesn't always help with concise language. And it certainly uh, proves to be innocuous language for things that are not innocuous. So this is, to me, bad sign off the bat in how this issue is being handled. And we also got to point out the man bun here on this dude. I mean, this guy's got gray hairs. I mean, he might be on the older end of millennial or the younger end of Gen X, but man bun is cringe, needs to be pointed out. QI family and friends and neighbors. And the reason why I wanted to title it that way is not only to honor those that uh, we get to love that would be in our friends, family and neighbors, but also to pause for a second and pray and ask, where is Jesus at work in this community? Mm -hmm. Because um, I think we can make a lot of assumptions that have really hurt us. Uh, and it also uh, helps us come in as listeners and learners with a posture of compassion. So kind of the frame of, of discussing this was really not only 
who do we get to pray for that would consider us friends and family and neighbors, but also in the midst of that, do we know their stories? Have we paused long enough to hear not only where there's pain uh, that Jesus is meeting with compassion or that he may be inviting us to express that compassion, um, but also to do it with a sense of hospitality of welcoming them into our lives as much as we get to be welcomed into their lives. I want to pause right here again because this is about a six minute clip that we're rolling through and we're doing pretty good. Um, but the worst part to me is at the end. So it kind of climaxes, but you see a couple foreshadows that I want you to pay attention to. And that is hospitality. He's using a, a very odd hospitality argument here to me that goes in a very unbiblical direction very quickly. So I just want to pay attention to, I want you to pay attention to that. And the idea that, oh, you know, Jesus is at work in this community. Well, again, is it really a community or is it a cult? And I think that's another compromise of language that we do. We don't, we kind of re legitimize the political labels when in reality, this is their alternative religion. Like this is what they're doing as their, you know, excuse to not be, you know, followers of Jesus. This is the sin that they love. This is the idol that they love that they're turning away from God to pursue. So we should rightfully view this as an idolatry type situation. And there's kind of this softballing of, you know, these people are, this is like, a, you know, community in a way he's treating it like an innocuous community, like a demographic community, like say, Hey, the black community or the white community, that Albanian neighborhood or um, that East village, New York, city and stuff like that so he's treating it like that oh god's at work and you know among these people and it's not exactly you know if god's at work among these people those people won't stay those people so it, it's a it's very bad logic and if you substituted a different sin for that it wouldn't work out well you would rightly or not rightly um if you thought there was some sort of double standard, you would wrongly be uh, indignant because you, you were okay with this, but not okay with, say, you know, talking about alcoholics or talking about adulterers, talking about pedophiles even, which not mutually exclusive categories with what they're talking about. And to do it with a humility as well as a hope that only God can provide. Yeah. So I love that, that phrase of um, walking with Jesus among our beloved LGBTQ uh, friends, family, and neighbors. So that you, you were just saying there, there, there's often a sense of like, either we're going to separate ourselves or we're going to take Jesus to them. Yeah. How is it different at a practical level to consider uh, walking with Jesus among them? Yeah, I think a key thing is, is there's so many beautiful ways in which God already knows their story, but we don't. And so, um, some of them are going to have a lot of church hurt in terms of the ways that uh, sadly, uh, they've been confronted or um, marginalized or ostracized. And, uh, and so being among them means do they see where we mourn with those who mourn? Uh okay, I got to pause right here. I hate the people that use this issue to attack the church. Like I said, you know, this is their alternative religion idolatry. And at the reality, you know, you know a lot of people who deconstruct from Christianity do so because, you know, three reasons. Um, they want to fornicate, they love porn, and, you know, other sexual immorality like these, like this. Um, those are three major drivers of um, people leaving Christianity, so to speak, if they, you know, grow up in the church or have a church, uh, cr culturally Christian atmosphere and upbringing. So we just got to be honest about that. So the idea that, oh, these people were told that, you know, this is a sin and therefore they have church hurt. Like, that's really what's going on here. Or, you know, they were marginalized. You know, they weren't allowed to be in children's ministry or stuff like that. And, you know, th th this type of stuff isn't a legitimate grievance against the church. It just isn't. Um, and in a way, are we trusting that the Holy Spirit will not only know how to listen well and be slow to speak, as James tells us, and quick to listen, but also in the moments we may have the privilege to speak the gospel, we'll be able to connect to those areas where maybe they don't see Jesus, but he's still trying to intersect and bring healing uh, in ways that only he can. Yeah. 
Um, you live in a, a coastal city. I live in a coastal city. I think some of the um, fear, you know, for people trying to do ministry or just do life as Christians among LGBTQ people is that there's an immediate rejection of us. I think there's a fear of like, they're going to hate us. They're going to think we're bigots. Right. We're not even going to have the opportunity to have relationship. So encourage me, encourage our friends that are on the other side of the camera, uh, that that's not the case, that there really is space for relationship and that there is a desire for relationship that we can then enter into. Yeah. I, I just, the, the energy, the kind of gay energy of you live in a liberal city. I live in a liberal city. It's like, kind of, you know, really sets the tone for this video clip here. And I think people can sense that fear. So part of it might be even like, Holy Spirit, uh, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. So I think part of that is, is we may need to pray for a little bit before we step in, but at the same time, um, admit, you know, where there are things that are wrong, it's okay to say, yeah, that was wrong. And so um, also uh, it's okay if, we do have an immediate reaction like that. Don't let the first rejection be the sense that like, oh, I'm bad at this, or like, this is never gonna work. Instead, be like, you know what? Um, that's kind of wearing the wounds of Jesus too. Like maybe I need to experience their pain. And so some ways they're trying to help me understand what they're going through rather than just seeing it us versus them. Instead mm -hmm. seeing we're us together, both needing Jesus and he's still teaching us who he is. And yeah. so maybe we get to learn through the moments where we get hurt too. Yeah, that's really good. We're now getting into um, the At worst the end part. of your talk, you gave a couple of practical things that people could do. Uh, I already mentioned to you one of them that I thought was just really brilliant, but uh, what are things churches can do to better more, not just more effectively, but maybe more lovingly, mm -hmm. more with more hospitality, yeah. um, engage these neighbors? Yes, I mean, part of it is is not only uh, welcoming them into your home, but like welcoming them into your lives. And so um, if there are neighbors that their families disown them for different reasons, it could be religious, it could be not, how do you open your house to be a place that uh, on holidays they know mm. your home is their home? Um, and in the midst of it, you know, celebrate. Celebrate their life, celebrate their birthday, celebrate their, uh, their moments that... Um, that you truly are glad that God's blessing them with gifts. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, in the midst of that, you'll be able to point back to the giver. Yeah. Um, another way with the church community would be, is there a community of people in your church? So I got to pause right here because this is some pretty dangerous advice in terms of who you let into your house. Like practically speaking, if you have you know, children in the home, this is bad advice. You shouldn't be letting, you know, potentially bad influences like that in the house. It's just not wise. You're not, you know, living in the blind side where you can take in someone, uh, you know, a, a, a male who's the same age as your daughter into your house. Like that, you know, that wasn't really wise at the time, but, you know, worked out well until like recent events um, for that family, at least. But, you know what I'm saying? But that's an exception. That's not something you should widespread prescribe, um, you know, if you have small children to let people who are sexual degenerates around them. Like that's not a good idea. And the other thing about, you know, celebrating life events thing, does that include, you know, gay weddings? Y you think it should go without saying that it doesn't, but it really doesn't with the posture and tone of this video. Church that are ready to go in with a posture of humility and a posture of hospitality in which they can disciple each other to be an inclusive family where people from the LGBTQIA could be wow, we're experiencing something here that's really amazing. Because um, they experience good love in their community. We just trust that God's love is so good that it's going yeah. to resonate in yeah. new ways. That's great. Well, I mean, this is one of the most difficult, uh, complex. So you hear that. This is, they experience good love in their community. And we just got to show them Jesus' love is better. It's even better. Do you hear that nonsense? That's the worst part of this video. He's calling sodomy good loving. That another dude behind you and you bent over is good loving. Or maybe you're the, you know, the one doing the uh, sodomizing. And someone else is the catamite. You ca That's not good loving. That is abhorrent. That is hatred of the body. That is a sin against 
both God before a holy God, but it's also a sin against yourself. That's not good loving. That is some perverted talk out of that dude. So that to me is the worst part. That is very much affirming of the lifestyle of the identity. And you're dressing evil actions in love. And that's simply not going to cut it. You're not going to make it with that type of mentality. Complicated and, and charged issues that the church is facing and the culture is facing right now. So I really appreciate the way you waded into that today. And it felt like your whole talk was an invitation to all of us in the room to just take steps towards the people in our lives. And man, that just sounds like Jesus to me. So I appreciate that very much. So, you know, he ends by saying this is such a difficult issue and, you know, thank you for helping us navigate it. But, and this is like the truncated version of a longer talk that he gave according to the beginning of the video. But th this does not help you at all. This does not answer practical questions like what happens if a child or if I have a sibling or um, someone, extended family member or best friend, neighbor. It doesn't answer any of these questions in a meaningful way. And because, frankly, they're probably not willing to go where they need to go. Not willing to say, hey, Jesus Christ can provide life change for you. They're not, they're not willing to say that. So th their mentality is, you know, we can just be nice enough and that'll make them understand that Jesus is the way and that Jesus' love is so much better. But you're also acknowledging that sinful behavior is good loving. But Jesus is so much better. Like, that is not a good sales pitch. You know, especially when you talk about, you know, how sex makes people feel. And I'm not trying to be crass about that, but, you know, you're talking about people who do something for sexual arousal, you know, trying to experience something, you know, they're chasing some sort of high. And then you're trying to promise them that Jesus is going to give them a better high. That's not the right way to address this issue. So this is just a major cringe clip from Acts 29, which is a notoriously woke institution um, and made their house decrease, especially if that's the direction that they're going in. So that's all I got to say about that. My name is Ray. This is the Evangelical Dark Web. If you like this kind of content, subscribe to the channel if you are new and podcast as well. Have a blessed day. We will catch you on the next one.